medcram.com. Welcome to another medcram lecture. We're going to talk about the liver. There's been some requests to go over the liver, and we're going to look over this in terms of an overview. And I first like to start with the anatomy. So if you can imagine the liver, it's a pretty large organ, it sits in the abdomen, and it has a number of functions, which we're going to go over. The first thing you've got to look at, as with anything, is see what goes into it and see what comes out of it. And the first thing that you'll notice with the liver is that there is two inputs to the liver. There is what's called a portal vein and a hepatic artery. So this is the hepatic artery. And there's two of them, they split. And this is not drawn to anatomical scale, it's kind of schematic. And this is coming from the heart. So this is oxygenated blood. The other input is the portal vein. And this is coming from the intestines. And this is important because a lot of medications that you ingest, and like pills, the first place that they go is to the liver. And so the metabolism of these medications first occur in the liver. This is called first pass metabolism. And then they go on to the heart. And that's the next part of the drawing here. You get the hepatic vein. And so you've got two inputs and one output. And so it's got to go through the liver if it's coming from the portal vein from the intestines. Now in terms of output or exocrine, we, we know what happens to endocrine. It goes into the blood. But in terms of exocrine, there's two major outputs. You've got a hepatic duct, a right hepatic duct, and a left hepatic duct and they combine into the common hepatic duct, and then they meet up with the cystic duct, which is from the gallbladder, which stores bile, and that forms the common bile duct, which then dumps into the intestines. And that's how the body gets rid of it. So the liver really has two functions. It has endocrine functions, and it has exocrine functions. The endocrine functions are hormones that are produced in the cells. They regulate glucose. Uh, they produce albumin. There's a whole bunch of things that they do. And their output gets dumped into the, to the hepatic vein. And that goes on to the heart, where it gets pumped for the whole body. The heart also pumps oxygenated blood to the liver, because the liver, just like any other organ, needs oxygenated blood to survive. And that's where it gets its supply. But the major source of blood supply to the liver is actually from the portal vein. And this includes the stomach, the duodenum, the uh, jejunum, the ileum, the colon, all the way down to the rectum basically is blood. All of the fatty acids, all of the nutrients that you get absorbed take a first pass and they go to the liver. And that's kind of the circulatory and the, the endocrine and the exocrine functions of the liver. Of course, the exocrine functions are, it produces bile. Bile is, are these things that break down fats. It what makes your uh, poo look brown, and 50% of it approximately is stored in the gallbladder at each meal, so it can be ejected into the cystic duct, into the common bile duct, and then into the duodenum, so it can help in aiding in digestion. The next thing I want to talk about are the blood tests that are associated with the liver, and, and these are sometimes uh, confusing. Let's go over those. The first one, or the first type of blood test that I want to go over are what I call the cytotoxic blood tests. So what are the cytotoxic blood tests? Well, the first one is the AST. This is also uh, known as the SGOT. This enzyme is actually made in the uh, liver. In fact, it's not specific to the liver. It's in a number of cells, but you can see it in uh, a number of cells, but also in the liver. The other one is the ALT, albumin and the PT. By the way, the ALT is also known as the SGPT. Okay, so AST and ALT are simply enzymes that are in the hepatocyte. And when the hepatocyte dies, these enzymes get released. So in this essence, these are like cardiac enzymes. Like when you have a heart attack, you release CK, CKMB, and troponin. When you have an injury of liver cells, that's when the AST and the ALT go up. Now, just like you can have uh, congestive heart failure and a low ejection fraction, and your heart is not contracting very well, and you have heart failure, you might not have elevated CK, CK, and B and troponins. The same way that if you can be in liver failure, in other words, your hepatocytes are not producing the things that the liver should do, you could also have low AST and ALT. 
So what do we use AST and ALT for? These are basically markers for hepatic inflammation. So hepatic inflammation is tracked by and seen as elevations in the ALT and the AST. And we'll get into a little bit about that in just a second. So the AST specifically has low specificity for the liver. Okay, It's seen in the periportal hepatocytes. Okay, Whereas the ALT has a high specificity for the liver. Okay, So think of the L here and the ALT as being standing for liver, whereas S is more for muscle. But they're both seen in the liver. Now, in terms of both of these, the AST and the ALT, they both go up in all forms of liver injury. It's only good for recent injury. So if there's old injury, you won't see these elevated. Okay, These tell you nothing about residual function. Okay. So if these are low, it doesn't mean that your liver function is low. It just means there's no current inflammation going on in the liver. It doesn't tell me if my liver is good and productive or if my liver is damaged and not functioning well. And the damage is not dose dependent. So if the AST and the ALT are coming down, this doesn't necessarily mean it's a good thing or it's a bad thing. In other words, a decrease could mean better or worse. So in other words, if the AST and the ALT are coming down, it could be that the liver is so damaged that there's no more cells to damage. Or it could mean that the AST and the ALT are coming down, therefore the damaged has ceased. Okay? It's kind of like fire and smoke. This is kind of like your smoke. Now, you could see smoke go away for two reasons, either because there's no more stuff to be burned or because the fire has been put out. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so I cleared the page so we can talk about albumin and PT. Let's talk about albumin. We've talked about albumin before, specifically when we're talking about anion gap. Albumin is a very complicated protein. It's made in the liver. And it, it's pretty reliable for looking at chronic hepatocellular injury. So if the albumin is low, that usually equals chronic liver injury. So if someone has an acute problem with the liver, their albumins usually stay up. And the reason why that is the case is because it's got about a 20-day half-life, which means it takes a long time for the albumin levels to start to go. So I would say this is a good marker for chronic liver disease. Finally, in the cytotoxic category, let's talk about the PT. So what is the PT? PT is the prothrombin time, and it's pretty reliable for both acute and chronic hepatocellular disease. So it's acute and chronic. The other way of looking at the PT is also the INR. So for instance, the PT might be 10, the INR is 1.0. Usually the PT is about 10 times that of the INR, but not always. And this is pretty important, and I'll tell you why. Because the PT or the INR simply measures the time of prothrombin to do its work, in other words, to have clotting. It's a clotting time. And clotting times require many different enzymes that are made in the liver. This is important so that because any enzyme that is not successfully made in the liver is going to interfere with the PT-INR. So it's very sensitive. In fact, the PT-INR is the most sensitive liver function test that can be done. In other words, this is the first thing that starts to get bad as the liver starts to fail because it requires so many proteins that are synthesized in the liver. And so what are the things that are associated with the PT? Well, it's factors. You may remember this from the clotting cascade, but factors related to vitamin K, which are 2, 7, 9, 10. Also, 1 and 5 are related to the PT. So what are some causes that could do this? Well, if the liver is not synthesizing these factors, it's going to take longer for coagulation to occur and therefore your PT and your INR will go up. So in liver disease, instead of it being a nice 1.0, you start to see it to go to 1.5, 2.0, etc. This is usually a good sign of chronic liver disease or acute liver disease, and it tells you just how bad their livers are.
Now, what are some other things other than liver disease that could cause it? Obviously, if the patient has low vitamin K, that's going to be a confounder. If the patient obviously is on Coumadin, which is a blood thinner, that's going to confound it. Okay, so let's review. The AST is a blood test that'll tell you if there's acute damage. It has a lower specificity for the liver than does ALT. It's increased in all types of liver injury. It's only good for recent injury. There's no indication of residual liver functional capacity. The damage is not dose dependent. All of those go for the ALT, except the ALT is a little bit more specific. So I would expect the ALT to be higher if it's specific to liver disease. The one exception to this is if you have alcoholic liver disease, in which case the AST and the ALT may be very similar. Sometimes that you even hear of a two to one or three to one ratio of AST to ALT in alcoholic liver disease. Okay, the albumin is reliable for chronic hepatocellular injury. It's synthesized in the liver. It's a marker for chronic liver disease and it's half-life, remember, is about 20 days. The PT is probably the most sensitive blood test for liver disease. And as a result, you'll see these elevations in chronic liver disease. Remember, it's obviously going to be elevated if you're giving the patient warfarin or Coumadin or things of that nature. Great. So that concludes this. Join us for our next lecture, which is going to talk about cholestatic liver function tests. Thanks very much.